Okay, let's do a Q&A on the fully 3D printed speaker based on Polymath 3D's design. Um, this is obviously, if you've not seen the last video, then this is not gonna make a lot of sense. So, you know, watch it up here somewhere. But yeah, lots of you left really good questions in the YouTube comments on the last video. So I'm gonna try to answer uh, the ones that came up the most in this video. And question number one is about the DSP that I'm using on this mini speaker. What is this module? So let me take it out real quick. Oh, maybe I should turn this off first. So this is an ADAO 8AAU um, 1701. And this is a little application board that you can get for like 15 bucks on AliExpress. Of course, the headers uh, that I'd soldered to these don't come stock. But yeah, this is a, a, just a little tiny board I've soldered um, pins to the back. And it's this little tiny DSP. It's got two analog inputs, it's got four analog outputs, so you can literally just plug in uh, a headphone cable to it and you get uh, four outputs if you want to do an active crossover or something on that. Um, but yeah, really capable chip. It doesn't do like the super advanced stuff, but for the basic stuff, this is amazing. And for 15 bucks, like you can't really go wrong. That sits in a custom, um, just a carrier board um, that has the input, a DC DC and a TPA3116 amplifier. This is a two channel, I think like 20, 25 watts or something usable. Amazing chip, like for the price and for the size, you can't really do any better than that. Now to program this DSP, you need a bit of specialty hardware. So this is a DIY USB-I um, analog devices that make the DSPs also sell these, for like a hundred something bucks, but you can really cheaply make these uh, just based on a evaluation board or a, a application board for the chip that's used in the official USB-I. Um, really simple to make. Um, all the tools are available for free for that. And yeah, I'm, I'm gonna leave some links for the programming hardware as well. And that just plugs into this board, like so you saw that in the video. And then this DSP gets flashed and it's permanently written to the uh, little EEPROM that's on this board. Now for the software to actually run this entire thing, um, that is Sigma Studio. Uh, which is also free. It's available from uh, analog devices as well. It's the official kind of DSP programming environment. It's all graphical. It's really simple to use and it goes perfectly with this chip. Now keep in mind that not all the features, not all the algorithms uh, are unlocked. Some of them you have to license and I don't think you can really do that as a as a hobbyist, but EQing and the super bass stuff and stereo widening and even microphone array stuff uh, is all in there. So you can use the stuff that you really want to use. You can use that all for free. So like I said, I'm going to leave the links to this uh, DSP board, to the programmer, you know, how you can build this yourself and Sigma Studio in the description below. I can really highly recommend these little boards. These just make speaker projects so much better. You can, you have so much more design freedom. All right, next question is, um, why did I not use any acoustic wadding, any acoustic dampening material inside this enclosure? So what is the goal of using this stuff inside an enclosure? Well, there are two things more or less. The first idea is it should reduce resonances. So if you have a cube, which is really the worst shape for your speaker, um, you're gonna have the same resonant frequency this way, this way, this way, then on all the diagonals from edge to edge as well, and then the other way diagonally, like you're gonna have so many uh, standing waves inside this enclosure and adding dampening supposedly uh, reduces that. Now, resonances aren't a huge deal at a speaker this size particularly, um, but also with using an infill shell. So this is a five millimeter shell. It's a solid two wall, three wall on the inside, then infill and then more walls on the outside. That should be dampening by itself already. And yeah, from the measurements, I didn't really see an issue with resonances where uh, acoustic wool would have helped. But the other thing that acoustic wool can do is it can make your enclosure sound bigger because it's essentially lowering the speed of sound. Any air movement is gonna have to find a way through this stuff and that's gonna slow it down. So you get the frequency response of a bigger enclosure out of a smaller one to an extent, like it's not like this is gonna triple the size of an enclosure, it's like 5% or something at best. But the downside to this is uh, it also reduces the efficiency of your driver or of your speaker as a system. And that can be quite significant. I've seen like two or three decibels of a loss in efficiency 
in drivers where I just pack the enclosure full versus using it empty. And with this build specifically, with the FT52, which is not a very efficient driver, I can use every decibel of output that I can get. So my choice was to leave out any sort of wool and to go for a speaker that is, you know, maybe a bit more efficient than if I had packed the stuff in there. And, you know, if there are resonances or, you know, if I want the bigger sound, that's what the DSP does. Then about the enclosure itself and the question, why did they use so much adhesive? Now, I guess the first question to that is which adhesive did they use? And that is the Sudal, so Soda uh, Fix All. This stuff might also be sold as Gorilla brand. It's just a you know clear, permanently flexible um, sealant. It's kind of like silicone, but better, I guess. It's not particularly special. But the question, why did it leave such large gaps and have to fill that with silicone is this was a really quick enclosure design. Like this was maybe 45 minutes in Fusion 360. I don't know, may maybe even just 30 minutes. I'll, I'll, put the, uh, I'll put the animated timeline here. And that means that I just didn't have the time to put screw connections in here or uh, like sealing lips that would make all this adhesive and sealant unnecessary. This is just super quick and dirty. If I would redesign this again, I would probably spend a day and just make this perfectly uh, airtight with using a minimal amount of sealant. Overall though, I think this design does a pretty good job of hiding its quick and dirty nature. Obviously the bottom is all taped, but um, yeah, I think it, it still looks pretty good for you know spending so little time on the design. And another thing that I was also asked quite often is, could I have used the uh, conductive filament, conductive PLA and the magnetic iron PLA or any other you know, conductive filament and iron filled filaments for the actual coil, for the winding and for the magnet or for you know, shaping the magnetic field. And there's, there's kind of two answers to this. Um, first of all, the conductive PLA or any sort of conductive PLA that you can get is not gonna be conductive enough to be usable for a coil. Because in the FT52, you have four meters of copper wire that you wind around the coil. And with copper, that's fine. But with the high resistance of this conductive PLA, that's that's barely gonna pass enough current to, to be detectable at the other end. Like you're not even gonna be able to light up an LED with the amount of current you're gonna pass at the voltages that these uh, speakers run at. So this unfortunately, is not a real option. There are processes to do 3D printed traces, which involves conductive inks. That's a bit expensive and it would also be pretty tricky to make a, a winding. I think it would be easier to actually just do a PCB and to use that as a coil. Now for the magnetic portion of the driver, um, there's the magnets that actually produce the magnetic field and then there's the washes in here that kind of shape it uh, into the form and the shape that we want. and for the magnets, I don't think you could magnetize this stuff enough uh, to actually be usable. This is just iron powder basically in PLA. Like you can magnetize this, but it's not going to produce as strong of a magnetic field as you would need. Now for shaping the magnetic field and for getting those, those field lines to flow perfectly through your coil, through your windings at the perfect angle, um, you know, kind of acting like a transformer core more or less. Uh, for that, this could actually be kind of useful. I'm not sure whether the fact that this is powdered iron and not like sheets or, or washers in this case um, that are continuous would change how suitable this is for shaping magnetic fields. But for example, in inductors for um, like power stages on, on your computer's mainboard, etc., for those applications, iron powder resins are the go-to uh, core material already. So this could maybe be useful actually. Now, there were also questions about the EQ that I'm running on the DSP. And if you look closely, I'm running like 20 decibel uh, by quads that is like individual EQ filters on there. And that is not something you would typically do. However, with this enclosure in particular, um, I don't think that sounds bad at all. Like you can absolutely butcher a speaker sound by putting EQ filters on there that are just too heavy. But in this case, I think it still sounds pretty natural. But the reason why I needed those in the first place is because this enclosure, passive radiator and driver are anything but control systems. Like if you buy uh, a commercial driver, these are PC68s and these are PR, I don't know what they're called. You get the exact parameters for the drivers, for the passive radiators. Um, they are mass produced and every single one is made exactly the same. So the parameters you get from the manufacturer 
are going to be the exact same ones that your drivers are going to have. In this case, where you're printing your own stuff, they're always going to vary. Like, the weights are going to be different, the stiffness, the rigidity of the surrounds and spiders are going to be different, and for example, the passive radiator, if you look at how soft this is, like, I don't think it's supposed to be that soft. Um, that might be a result of me using Ninja Flex for the surrounds and the spiders, which is an Shore 85A, whereas the original design was calling for a Shore 95A, uh, so a good bit harder. Paul did recommend to me to use a filament that is as soft as possible, but of course that is going to change the acoustic performance of the passive radiator and the driver. So the cabinet design of combining the PR61 with the FT52 in a one liter enclosure, probably was a bit off with the softest round and spider material. Next, about the sponsorship from Elegu with the Neptune 2. Like there, there was one comment was like, hey Tom, you only use the Neptune because you got paid to do so, right? And I mean, who are we kidding here? You know, if I had free choice of printers, I'd be using the Prusa Mark III just for everything. You know, this is my go-to printer. If I just want to print something, that's what I use. But I also do get comments uh, complaining about the fact that this is a $800 kit or a $1,000 assembled machine, which is a lot more expensive than what most people are using. So I thought, hey, this might be a good chance to try out a cheaper printer, um, and that is the Neptune 2. The Neptune 2, when it's available, uh, is 160 bucks, which is obviously one-fifth less than one-fifth of one single Mark III. It's, it's even cheaper than a Prusa Mini. And by having to use a printer for an actual project, I actually, you know, learned to appreciate it. It's This is a really good printer for the money, especially. And honestly, if you compare it to an Ender 3 or an Ender 3v2, um, this would be my go-to. Some of the features that I originally shrugged off and was like, well, what what is this supposed to do? Like the, the non-magnetic flex bed. I really learned to appreciate because it's like a, you know, last ditch. If something is, is stuck to your bed, like you can just take it off and flex it. You're not going to do that for every print, but you can do it if you have to. I think this is a good printer. And as always with sponsorships on this channel, um, the only reason why those brands get to sponsor videos is because I think they are making a good product. So yeah, Neptune 2 um, review probably in a month or so, but this is a good printer. Would I have used it if I had absolutely free choice of which printer to choose? Absolutely not. But I think it is very much worthy of being promoted on the channel because it is, I think, a good product. And if you're asking like, hey, why is the print quality so bad? First of all, it's not that bad. It's, it's actually pretty decent. Uh, second of all, this was all done. All the parts that are printed on the Neptune were done on like the 0 0.2 to 0.3 millimeter draft fast profile. I'm not even sure if Elugu validated those profiles um, that they have in their Cura version for this printer specifically, or if they're just in there because Cura has them. But yeah, this was done on the fastest, sloppiest setting there is, and I think for that, it did pretty well. And lastly, were there challenges with the build? And yes, this was absolutely not an easy print, especially the FT52 uh, driver. The first one that you can see is all these surrounds, they are coming apart super easily. And you know, just the peaks, those ridges on the surround. Are you focusing? Yeah. Those are very challenging to get to close. So it would print the peak up to the top point perfectly. It was just like, yeah, well, I'm not going to print that connecting piece between those two halves. And that was one of the biggest challenges when printing this Ninja Flex. It might be specific to Ninja Flex. It might be something that applies to all the flexibles. The solution that solved that was to enable detect thin walls in Prusa Slicer. Um, I think Slick Thrower has it as well, but Cura does not. So I could not, I could literally not print this on the uh, Neptune, even though the Neptune was handling flexibles really well. Of course, I could have tuned in a Prusa Slicer profile for the Neptune, but time was my constraint there. Um, that would have taken, I don't know, a day to get it perfect, and even then I didn't know it would work out. So doing that on the Prusa was the obvious choice for me. Now, the other thing is these cones, and these are quite tricky because they're like a, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, they're printed thin wall. they're printed in vase mode, and they're like a 50 degree overhang, um, one wall, and it's just 
an overhang all around. These are super tricky to print. Um, I ended up printing them in Color Fabrics T. Uh, Color Fabrics T first issue, it was wet because it's been outside, so I had to dry that. That took me a day to get a functional cone out, but eventually that worked. So overall, the challenge level of this driver is pretty high, but it is very satisfying to get it done. It's not impossible at all, but you need to know how to print flexibles, how to print uh, thin wall parts, and how to print overhangs really well, and your printer needs to be able to do that. The other thing that I ran into is that this magnet tube actually popped apart on the very first um, chassis that I printed. So this in the center here is the tube that holds the magnets, um, and as you can see, it extends through the, uh, through the cone of the speaker, basically forming a magnetic field um, that the coil can ride up and down in. So that is a single walled, single walled? Yeah, that's a single walled tube. And the first time I tried to screw this together, it just popped apart. So that's also something that you kind of have to account for. Your parts need to be somewhat strong. Here's how it's supposed to look. Here is how, you know, the first one fell apart. Um, your parts do need to be pretty strong. Um, because these magnets, once the, these are pushed in, they do push apart quite hard. So some of you were also asking about details about how this is assembled, you know, how the magnets go in and which orientations. Um, let me just say this much. There are three magnets, three of those 15 by three millimeter magnets um, in one orientation with a washer to distribute the magnetic field or amplify it or whatever, um, going one way and then three more going the opposite way so it, it pushes apart and kind of concentrates the magnetic field in the center there. But if you want the full details on how this is assembled, um, Paul, Paul MA3D, has obviously published a full guide on you know every single bit from you know assembling the surround to the cone on doing the magnets um, adding the washes what they do so you can find that on the page for the FT52 I think it's on Prusa printers and uh, on Paul's website as well so I hope that answers the questions that you guys might still have had about the FT52 about this build uh, specifically um, I know that the build montage in the video maybe wasn't super informative. Uh, because I didn't talk through it. I didn't have, you know, a full voiceover. Usually my videos are just me non-stop talking, like this one. And I wanted to try something different, something a bit more relaxed. And I think that turned out pretty nicely. It was something that was a bit more chilled, a bit more laid back to watch. So yeah, thanks for watching. Get subscribed for future projects. Uh, but also keep on making and I will see you in the next one. Bye.